Israel is deliberately keeping the humanitarian aid in as difficult as possible. And we are fighting with time right now. We have a very little time. And we have 1 million people, 50% are in severe danger. So my guess is they are trying to make them leave, but there's no place to live. Earlier this week, the European Union accused Israel of using starvation as a weapon of war in Gaza. This famine is not a natural disaster. It's entirely man-made. Israel is provoking famine. This is unacceptable. Starvation is used as a weapon of war. Yes, starvation is used as a weapon of war. That was the European Union foreign policy chief, Joseph Borrell, talking on Monday. Israel denies these allegations, which are some of the strongest words we have heard about the situation in Gaza from a Western power since October. They were spoken on the heels of a UN-backed report that warns that more than one million people, half of Gaza's population, are projected to face catastrophic starvation conditions in the next few months. In other words, famine is looming. The report, which was put together by agencies from 19 countries, including the Canadian International Development Agency, goes on to say that without an immediate ceasefire and a surge of food to areas cut off by fighting, mass death in Gaza is imminent. After reading the report, the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres had this to say. We must act now to prevent the unthinkable the unacceptable and the unjustifiable. Scholars of famine say that this is, in fact, the worst food deprivation they have observed in war since the Second World War. And under international law, intentional starvation of a population is considered a war crime. That's a lot to take in, I know. But we're going to try and break it all down for you today with someone who really knows the issue well. Hilal Elver is the former United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, a position she held for six years from 2014 to 2020. She's also a research professor of global studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and a global distinguished fellow at the Resnick Food, Law, and Policy Center at UCLA Law School. Hilal currently serves on the Committee of Experts at the World Committee of Food Security and Nutrition. Welcome, Hilal. Thank you. As a former UN Special Rapporteur on the right to food, how would you describe what you are seeing in Gaza? I mean, it's very difficult to describe because the whole world is talking about imminent, horrifying, humanitarian, uh, humanities catastrophe, especially Secretary General. He was saying it's not a humanitarian catastrophe, it's a humanities catastrophe. Since October 7, the world has never been such an intensive kind of action against the civilian population in the small parts of the world. You know, this we are talking about very small area, which is Gaza Strip. And since 2007, this area was under siege anyway, and more than 50% of 60-70% of the Gazans were under humanitarian aid since 2007. And thinking about it recently, this become even more horrific than we can even imagine. Gradually, maybe the Western countries are trying to understand the severity of the situation. But when it started in October 7, of course, nothing it started in October 7. That's also the important thing. It's not a vacuum. Yes, it was a terrible attack by, by the Hamas. But uh, the mm, collective punishment is unheard because 100% of Gazans, women, children, young, old, Hamas, non-Hamas, Everyone is under the same situation, and there is no way to escape. These people are going from north to south, 
south to north again, and the Gaza divided to two pieces, north and south. It was already extremely crowded area that the human catastrophe, it's not only a starvation, not only famine, but the health impacts and people lose everything and their home and their small, tiny gardens. It was a terrible case before, and now it's beyond our imagination. You mentioned that, I think it's the UN Secretary General said, this is not a humanitarian crisis, but it's a humanities crisis. Can you explain that just a little bit? Well, Secretary General from the day first was trying to do the ceasefire. And actually, he went to Egyptian gate and in order to get into Gaza. The Israeli government didn't allow him to come into the Gaza. This is unheard. We know Israel was not very cooperative with human rights councils. No special rapporteur on occupied territories was able to enter to uh, Gaza or uh, West Bank. But Secretary General, I mean, that was a kind of hard to believe rejection of the international order by Israel. And also what Secretary General is trying to say, the world somehow divided to two camps and the Western countries, basically the European United States and the Commonwealth countries are actually blindly supporting Israel's self-defense, which is not a self-defense. This is beyond the self-defense. And the global South is completely unified and uh, try to stop what's happening in Palestine. This is a new kind of world order that we are seeing. That's why I think the humanities crisis, he tries to say this, why we don't use our humanity, but what we think about our geopolitical interests. I can understand Israel's founding was also important after the humanitarian catastrophe. Now we are completely seeing historical problem repeating again this time, but victims and perpetrators become completely different. That's, that's a very interesting and also very sad story, I think. Let's talk about this report on Monday. What's important about this new report, do you think? So in December, the earlier report by IPC, they made exactly the same language. They said, listen, you should stop the war or you should allow a kind of humanitarian aid in order to protect people going to severe hunger. According to this report, the report just, just came yesterday and IPC became again some kind of important news event. From December to yesterday, March 18, the situation become more and more serious in a very short period of time. Now, either emergency or catastrophe. And catastrophe is 50%. They divided the Gaza north and south. North, something has to be done before May for the north, and something has to be done before July for the south. These are all technical information. How many people stays in 24 hours with only one meal or how many children malnutritious between zero to two, zero to five, all these kind of figures, technical figures, definitions, and also has to be announced by the United Nations there is a famine here. So now they are in the situation to make it announcement but this is also problematic because these announcements become geopolitical issue because the governments don't want to do this. Possibly they say, oh, they died because they did have some conditions, that combination of this, this. But in Gaza, conditions means unhealthy situation, no clean water, no any kind of sanitation, no hospital. If you get a kind of diarrhea, there is no medicine. And these children die from not being able to have food or this communicable disease that easily be treated if there was a medicine. So in war situation, 
these conditions become together. Just for instance, humanitarian aid, very strangely, in Gaza become subject of the negotiation. Humanitarian aid cannot be subject of the negotiation. When they were talking about the ceasefire, all humanitarian aid issues were coming. This has to be unconditional. Until end of October, Israel never let even one truck to Gaza. Then, because of the international pressure, they started to give the humanitarian aid permission, but what they were doing, very cumbersome investigation. Hours and days, trucks were staying there. For instance, if you find the one thing that Israel didn't accept, let's say tents. Tents are not allowed because there's a metal part. They don't want to enter Gaza. If there's a tent in the humanitarian aid, they return completely entire aid. So it is extremely cumbersome, extremely arbitrary investigation by Israel. Israel is deliberately keeping the humanitarian aid and as difficult as possible. And we are fighting with time right now. We have a very little time. And we have 1 million people, 50% are in severe danger. So my guess is they are trying to make them live, but there's no place to live. And if they live, they will not be come back again. Everyone knows about it. So what what could be done? Well, you're talking about the delivery of aid and including the too small and the inefficient airdrops that we've all seen on TV and online and the violence that we've seen at food distribution points. And right now, the United States has funded basically a makeshift port. They're saying that they're going to create a makeshift port to bring ships in to bring aid. I'm wondering what you think of that approach. First of all, it takes too long. There's no time for three months. I mean, I I have no idea what they're talking about. It's very difficult to do it. Very dysfunctional. All the humanitarian aid organization repeatedly told the United States government, you cannot do this air, the food aid, because it's so dysfunctional, so impossible. And scale-wise, for Gaza, it will not work. And also United States, strangely enough, in one hand, they are trying to drop food. At the same time, they are giving still military aid to Israel without any condition. So these two kind of hypocritical policies never going to help. There's a domestic election coming and many American people. Even the Democratic Party voters, more than 60%, 70% of them, clearly they want ceasefire. But Biden administration, somehow, they are trying to make a kind of makeup version of these helicopters or the parachuting. And some children died and they said, no, 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 they didn't die because of this. So that's a kind of dysfunctional humanitarian aid. There's a bunch of places uh, in Gaza you can enter. They only keep the Egyptian gate. They could have done other places. Easily humanitarian aid come in, but they don't allow them because they don't want this issue will be solved. It's sort of mind-blowing that in the middle of all of this, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees, or UNRWA, was defunded because supposedly some of its employees have supported Hamas during the October 7th attack on Israel. I'm wondering how much that removal of funding has played into what we're seeing right now, this famine. Well, UNRWA was a very important organization since 2007. UNRWA is a kind of bloodline of Gaza. Education, health, all kind of uh, human systems is under UNRWA. Strangely enough, when the International Court of Justice made a decision 
it was a very shocking decision for the world. They didn't say you should make the uh, ceasefire because ceasefire is not under their domain, but they said stop any kind of condition that goes to plausibility of the genocide. So this decision will be too long, three years, four years, but they just kind of provisional decision to stop the humanitarian problems. Now South Africa is going again to uh, court asking what happened after the provisional decision, Israel didn't do anything, can we repeat it again? It didn't go to the mainstream media, but there will be another hearing soon about it. But the long story short, after the decision of International Court of Justice, suddenly UNRWA problem came out. The investigation started whether or not that was the correct uh, accusation, but uh, many international community, many developed countries stopped helping them financially. Still, the investigation is going on, but some of the countries decided, I think we should start again because this is going to be a very difficult situation. UNRWA is a vital organization. You can't stop UNRWA. After the court decision, the war became even more problematic. They were attacking the humanitarian aid and work food program said that if you attack the humanitarian aid, we cannot really do it and they stopped the aid. So Israel was blaming that Hamas were attacking and there was also another blame that Israel was attacking. So we saw some kind of videos in social media. People were killed, hundreds of people were killed. And Israel said that, oh, we didn't, we didn't kill them, but they were attacking us. Are you talking about the food delivery? Yeah, that... food delivery. Yeah, exactly. There are a bunch of accusations from both sides. But right. the clarity is humanitarian aid was blocked one way or another. And with the humanitarian food aid hopefully starting to perhaps come back with the funding of some, as you mentioned, some countries now agreeing to refund this very vital United Nations organization, what else do you think the international community needs to be doing at this time? Well, of course, this is just the humanitarian aid part. Israel says, no, we are sending the humanitarian aid. We are allowing bunch of trucks or something. So he said, she said kind of things. First of all, they should stop giving any kind of military aid to Israel or any war area. It doesn't matter Israel, same thing in Sudan, same thing in Yemen. No military aid, any kind of active war. A Security Council even <laughs> they are not even able to make it a uh, ceasefire resolution, but individual countries should do that. For instance, U.S. can say, okay, we don't give any more military aid to, to Israel. This is not going to happen. But maybe some other countries, maybe Sweden or maybe Canada or some other kind of economic sanctions. Many of the countries, including the U European Union, because European Union is the biggest trade partner of Israel, they can easily make a decision about not investing, not allowing trade to Israel in order to sort of give them a certain kind of limitation. If you really want to stop this human catastrophe, you have to stop helping them and you have to start isolating them. As a UN Special Rapporteur, I'm sure you've seen a lot. I'm wondering if you can explain how this is different in Gaza from some of those other areas. Sudan, you mentioned, Yemen. Now it's the Yemen and South Sudan is very active and they are also under the conflict areas. South Sudan, also combination of the climate change. Afghanistan, also same. They are having a serious kind of catastrophic drought, but they are also post-conflict countries. That countries, 
they have combination of the conflict and other reasons. In Gaza, full problem of the conflict, first of all. There is no other impact that makes the famine more problematic. Secondly, it goes completely entire population and in the entire region. In Sudan and Yemen, part of the countries, the fight is happening and also kind of problematic part blocking the humanitarian aid, not to the entire country, but only parts. So that's why in speed and then comprehensiveness are very different in Gaza and no one is excluded. You said that in Gaza, children go up very fast and you've called this a war against children. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, the issue is very, very sad, actually, because Gaza is very high population, young generation. 50% of the population are under 18. You see always children. We see them in our TV every day. It's not something hiding. And also even Israel does not really hide. We are living in the social media world. We can see everything. And you see children are right now in charge of getting water, in charge of going to humanitarian trucks, getting a little bit of food. That's why they're not anymore children. And also malnutrition case is more than a problematic of famine. Let's say we have 50% famine under serious uh, danger, but other 50% is almost all of them are going to have a serious kind of health problem in the future. Not only health problem, but also brain damage because between zero to two years old, even the short period of time of malnutrition, which is three months, then you lose the kind of brain power, not only immune system problems. So we see the future generation of Gazas are in serious trouble. Even we stop the war right now, we're gonna lose this generation. There's no, no way to correct or recover this generation. So you know this amputation is incredible. I mean, never heard in any, any conflict that too many children amputated without even anesthetic. This is, this is very hard. The children are born and the second day they died because the mother didn't have enough milk to give the child. So in this yesterday's report, FAO become adamant about livestock. And I was surprised why they're worried about livestock. The livestock is the food for the children. The milk, 70% of the livestock was killed right now. And also now they are trying to put the animal feed to Gaza to get the milk for the children. Well, it's incredible. Now people are eating animal feed in Gaza. So this is unheard situation. And we are hearing them every day. Experts have been sounding the alarm, as you said, for longer than just since December. You you even go back to 2007. But even if we're just talking about the shorter history, what is the actual issue here with following international laws? We've had these international laws in place to prevent crimes against humanity. And yet here we are. Well, we are talking about impunity. I mean, there are a bunch of criminal issues that was right now subject to be prosecuted. War crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, crimes of starvation. All of them are a bunch of international law principle, international criminal court, and also international court of justice. International court of justice is just the one you talked about, but I'm talking about international law of 1977, the Rome Statute, 1998. I mean, these things were put in place post-Second World War, but there's been so many examples now of 
horrific crimes against humanity, and each time we try and pass a law to stop. So, in normal and perfect world, we have international humanitarian law, we have international human rights law, and we have international criminal law. They all have their own specific mandate and specific jurisdiction. For instance, international human rights law are applicable in this kind of case, either peacetime or the wartime. So you have to have a right to food, right to housing, right to water, right to health, right to education, no matter what. It's a wartime or peacetime. International humanitarian law is basically protecting civilians in times of war. International humanitarian law constantly was violated. International criminal law is when the violations occur, they are the court, they are the prosecution, they are bringing justice to that kind of serious humanitarian violation. But International Court of Justice is not a criminal court. It's a regular court. At the end of whatever the decision will be done, it will not be a criminal decision. They are investigation whether or not the crime of genocide occurred or not. This is not the only happen in Gaza. Two, three years ago, there was a case, Gambia brought the case against Myanmar exactly about the genocide, and court exactly made the decision provisionally. They said, yes, it would be plausible. Palestine, Israel case is not new for the International Court of Justice. And same thing. Court is trying to do their best. But at the end, who will be implementing international system based on consensus? If there is no consensus, international law cannot be implemented. Or if there is no unity in the Security Council to block the war, which they are the most powerful among the international organizations or international system, but the veto power of the five big countries, which is the winners of the world war, they can block. For instance, the Ukraine case also blocked by Russia, and this Palestine case blocked by the United States. So there's always good friend in the Security Council to escape. So there's a strong impunity. In relation to starvation, even more severe impunity, because starvation as a war machine, killing machine, has been used historically. In many, many conflicts, Palestine is not the only one. It will not be the only one. But unfortunately, it's ne no country or no armed forces was punished by any international court, including domestic court. So that's a kind of thing. Either the causality is very difficult or because of the geopolitical reasons, the court cases doesn't go through or prosecutor just throw away, or sometimes even there is a genocide, the starvation comes second. They don't really care about the starvation, they go to the genocide. And the starvation case is so long-term impact of the future generation. This Gaza case, because it's too severe, too open, too in front of our eyes, will make a little bit of difference in relation to uh, getting rid of impunity. That's the only hope. That was my last question, is that it is very hard. It's very, very difficult to see any way through this. As you said, even if you stop it right now, it's like the impacts are ongoing generationally for the future children, especially, but for everyone. What keeps you motivated here? What gives you that glimmer of hope? Well, the glimmer of hope, things are slightly changing. There is something going on, but it has to be faster. First of all, they have to stop fighting. Stop fighting, stop killing. If this would happen very soon, 
then will be recovery possibility. And also Israel will be recovered too, because they've become kind of persona, the country non grata, which should not be that way. Of course, internally, the Israeli citizens are important. If they support ceasefire, maybe Israeli government will change. They will be maybe revolution. The young generation will not be part of that kind of atrocities. So that's the hope for the young generation. Same thing for Palestinians. Young generation maybe will be much better ideologically and future-wise, democratically. It will have a better place in Gaza. So future is for the young generation's hand. That's what I'm hoping. Hilal Elver, thank you so much for your time and the work that you do. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, that's it for this episode of Don't Call Me Resilient. Thank you for listening. Be sure to follow us so that you don't miss next week's episode. We'll be revisiting the issue of famine and forced starvation, this time from a historical perspective, as a tool of colonialism, in two very different locations, Canada and India. Our guests are two excellent and fascinating Canadian scholars. In the meantime, reach out to us and tell us what you thought of this episode or share ideas for stories or guests. We'd love to hear from you, our listeners. You can reach the team at dcmr at theconversation.com. Follow us on Apple and Instagram at Don't Call Me Resilient Podcast. Don't Call Me Resilient is a production of The Conversation Canada. The series is produced and hosted by me, Vinita Srivastava. This episode is co-produced by associate producer Atika Kaki and our student, journalist, assistant producer, Hussein Haveliwala. Krish Dinesh Kumar does our sound design and mixing. Our consulting producer is Jennifer Moroz. Lisa Varano is the managing editor of The Conversation Canada, and Scott White is the CEO. Zaki Ibrahim wrote and performed the music we use on the podcast. The track is Something in the Water. 